We've just heard from uh, three speakers. Now there are many skyscrapers around the world. And uh, against this backdrop, what is the identity of Tokyo? That was the first question that was raised from uh, Professor Zukin. Uh, she had spoken about authenticity. What is authenticity? That was the question that was raised, inclusive of the culture or from a sociological point of view, how should that be thought about? That was the point that was raised. And then Mr. Marlott had gone on to speak about the uh, most up-to-date, the pioneering ideas now available in the world. And then Professor Yoshimi, had said, spoken about um, the northern area. I do not mean to deny the northern part of Tokyo. I am also born in Hongo area, so I don't mean to deny that area. But at the same time, I cannot neglect that th southern parts of Tokyo. A lot of the weight is coming towards south. Now, the question is, is there an identity in Tokyo? And the answer to that is that it, I cannot say that it does not exist. It does exist. As Mr. Yoshimi had said, history is something that creates identity. And ultimately, that would determine the landscape and the features of each city. And what has happened in Tokyo, for example, the system I don't know to area since Meiji era, this has been the center of offices, center of business. And then Asakusa area, uh, this was, has flourished the most during the era, uh, Edo era. And then if you go to Ginza, this is the modernized Japan. Uh, this was a driving force of the economy back then. And you go to Nihonbashi, this also dates back to the Edo era, it used to be the center. And now there is this a uh, highway above it, and this is the point, a central point of Japan. And then the Odaiba area, the coastal area that was uh, developed through the 1980s, 1990s, and is still ongoing. And you go to Shinagawa. This is the southern area that the Professor Yoshimi does not like. Probably Shinagawa is going to be the crucial point in Tokyo in the future. And now we come to Roppongi. <coughs> After the Tokyo Olympics in 1964, this was the area that had expanded together with the Aoyama Street development. And then Shibuya. For long term, it has sprawled as a terminal point. It still continues to develop. And then lastly, we have Shinjuku. Kabukicho is one area, but at the same time, there is a s amazing energy there. So Tokyo has many centers many downtown areas, and there are no other cities where you have so many downtowns or city centers. But there's no wonder about it. There is the 37 million people living in this metropolis area, and there are a lot of different cultures that are brought together, and they all create different cultures. So this is the reason why it's so different. In London, you may have West End, East End, and the center. It's like a three different areas. In New York, there is Midtown, Downtown, maybe three or four districts. And then now more development in Brooklyn and more towards the, the north. However, in Tokyo, we have as many as this. There are no other cities like this. This is because of the history as Professor Yoshimi had spoken, it's the history of Tokyo that has created the identity of uh, Tokyo. This was in back in the Meiji era when Edo was uh, converted into Tokyo. And this was like meant to be like uh, London. They wanted to create a city like London. This is the originating point of Marunouchi. And uh, this is the first building, Marunouchi, and it looks like this today. The first building is now restored, and the rest is the high-rise buildings. And this continues to be the business center of Tokyo. And this is Asakusa, the Kaminari Mon, the Kaminari Gate, where they see a lot of uh, tourists gather, and you can have a lot of uh, experience. The Edo period ambience. 
and there is an Akamise shopping street, Nihonbashi. During the Edo period, there was Ginza, the gold minting area, and this was very active back then. And in the 1964 Olympics, they built this highway, and they're now trying to remove it. And in Ropongi, it looked like this. There was a wide path like this in the past. And there were many uh, military bases here. And the American forces also came here. And the American culture had spread. And then during the Olympics, the highway was built. In the northern area, there were a lot of culture that developed during the Meiji era, whereas in this area, culture had developed in the latter half of Showa period. Again, we have the high row highway and the high rise buildings, and you see the Ropongi, the midtown. This is another center of uh, Ropongi. And this is the old Shibuya. They were, did not have a train back then. This was, has also served as a center of uh, various activities, and it was a valley. So you see the slopes going up. And now Shibuya is going through a major transformation. And as the center of the southwestern part of Tokyo, Shibuya has developed. And this is the world famous scrambled intersection. All of the tourists, a lot of tourists come here. And all the people walk at the same time, uh, but they never bump into each other. This is one of the biggest mysteries of the world. This is the, one of the most well-known scrambled intersection. And Piccadilly Circus in London, they have also adopted this type of intersection. And here it says, what is the identity of Tokyo in the future? The question is, how is Tokyo going to evolve in order to create its unique identity? I don't mean to deny the North, but uh, what do we do with the South? And we may see more transfer towards the South. This is something I'd like to discuss during the panel discussion. Thank you. So now we would like to have three speakers on the stage, and we would like to have a panel discussion. We have about 30 minutes, <coughs> and at the end, we'd like to have 10 minutes or so to receive questions from the floor. So before that, I first would like to ask, raise some issues, um, because three of you talked about three different things. So I would like to sort, explore the what, what's common through amongst your presentations. Well, the theme is the identity of Tokyo. So in your talk, um, based on your talk, what will be the intersection between your talk and also Tokyo and its identity? Now, I just said that identity of Tokyo could be diversity. Regarding this idea, what do you think? Maybe you think, no, diversity is not identity. Maybe you have some idea about whether or not Tokyo has identity at all. I would like to have a very candid conversation with you. Can we start with you, Sharon? I have learned in um, my travels and studies around the world that diversity means different things in different mm -hmm. national and urban contexts. In Europe, for example, uh, diversity often means uh, to bring more native-born people into districts which have attracted concentrations of immigrants. In the United States, diversity usually means the opposite of that. That means to bring more outsiders, more migrants from overseas into the heart of cities. 
in sociology, and perhaps in Tokyo also, diversity is less demographic and more functional. So that when you speak of diversity, Professor Ichikawa, you are thinking of a functional and even a geographical diversity. But to speak frankly, I ask, where is the demographic diversity? Where are the people from outside being brought inside the city? Uh, where are the changes in the national policy that would encourage and accommodate immigrants? What would that mean for the identity of Japan as well as the identity of Tokyo? I understand what you're saying very clearly. Because um, regarding this definition of diversity, um, I mean, diversity, this theme comes up often in the international conferences around the world, but I do understand and I do agree that the definition is really diverse. Um, uh, Professor Zukin and Professor um, Yoshimi are sociologists, but I'm from architecture, so I think already there is a diversity, right? I mean, the definition of diversity must be different between two disciplines. When it comes to ethnicity, probably Tokyo is the uh, most um, slow, the, the slowest mover amongst all the global uh, cities because we are really um, um, even uh, homogeneous uh, society here. Uh, so part of your response was something that I've expected. But in terms of uh, spatial um, urban space, I think it has uh, diversity. You might think, Sharon, that it's really flat uh, or one-dimensional. But in the aspect of uh, spatial uh, character, I think that diversity does exist. Um, so um, I would like to ask uh, your opinion, Mr. Mallot. Tokyo is maybe the one place Let me take this off. where we can talk about the low city, the high city, and the deep city, mm -hmm. and we would be talking about the same city. Uh, I think Tokyo has this wonderful juxtaposition of scale, uh, both in size, but, but also in time. Uh, so we can get something like Roppongi Hills, big, big, big project, uh, literally next door to like a, like a noodle shop uh, or an old shrine. Uh, and that's what makes, thank you, that's what makes Tokyo so fascinating, I think, for people who visit it. Um, in the sense of maintaining a unique identity, just spatially, uh, to give uh, Professor Zukin credit for a comment, uh, Tokyo is doing a wonderful job. Uh, there is a, a distinctness to the city, I think, in the way that it's maintained the sort of randomness of its roads, right? Um, yet, traffic is manageable, right? Um, there's no grid, and yet things seem ordered. Uh, so these things, I guess, from um, someone coming from New York is, is truly wondrous, right? It's kind of a paradox, but Tokyo is this wonderful paradox. Um, I was actually born here, so I've been coming back here for uh, so many times, but each time I come back, I feel like the city keeps getting more and more interesting. Um, and it is taking steps, I think, very incrementally uh, towards becoming more global, uh, towards becoming more inclusionary. Uh, that being said, I, I do think Japan faces tremendous challenges moving forward. Um, and it is a, a question of national importance. Does Japan want to remain a global power, okay, uh, which is foreseeable, very difficult to do in the face of a sort of declining and growing population? Um, or does it want to just sort of go the way of Switzerland or Europe, you know, some, some place that has a very high quality of life, but not necessarily at the forefront of global power innovation anymore. Um, so that's a fundamental choice, and I think it does have to deal with uh, the issue of immigration that the professor brought up. Okay, Professor Yoshimi, what do you think about the same question? Well, regarding diversity, the first thing I remembered was uh, uh, a picture called Swimming. 
I think many of you know this book. So when you have a small child, or when you had a small child, do you remember that you read this book to your child or children? The Swimmy, this book, is about the small fish called Swimmy, and this small fish was about to be eaten by a big fish like tuna. And in order to make it look big, they work together with other small fish to make a shape of a big fish. And they pretended as if they're together uh, one fish, one big fish, and they um, beat it, uh, bigger fishes. But I remember swimming was a red fish, and all the rest of the small fish were blue or black. And I think I, it's analogous to Tokyo. Now, I think you pointed out the two types of diversity, uh, spatial diversity and the other is social diversity. And in Tokyo, I think in terms of diversity of space, the score is very high. It's very, very rich in terms of spatial diversity. When you think about facilities, for example, let's say there's a huge cultural um, um, facility in terms of uh, art museum, there are many fine museums, and yet they are not in, they are not really comparable to Louvre or British uh, Museum. They are better by far, but Tokyo is number one in terms of having many many small uh, museums and many attractive restaurants, for example, and uh, so once. These two small sites are well connected with each other. Just in the case of swimming picture book, we can create a, a wonderful big city. So there's a potential for Tokyo. And another sense of uh, an, another thing about the uh, diversity in Tokyo is the geographical diversity. There are hills, there are valleys, and small topologies do exist here. Uh, there are ups and downs in the landscape. So. Actually, the landscape you can see, the view you can get uh, is different uh, depending on where you're standing. Um, of course, when you have a high scrapers, you would see the same um, even view. But at least on the street level, you have different views. So in terms of geometry, uh, geography, and also in terms of facilities, we do have diversity. But when you think about linguistic and uh, uh, social diversity, we are behind London, Tokyo, Paris by far. We are really low in the diversity score in that sense. When you look at the internationalization or globalization of universities, you can you, you know the situation. Uh, we're the same in Tokyo universities. What about the number of exchange students from outside of Japan? What about the lessons or classes taught in English? How much are we doing this? Well, we really regret, and I do regret the current situation. So in terms of culture and uh, a society were not really diverse. And yet, spatially, and also in terms of gra geography, we are diverse. So then the question we should think about is to how to connect and combine these two types of diversity. That's the basic situation, the questions we have to think about for the future of Tokyo. Thank you very much. Uh, spatial diversity and social diversity are different, as you say. When it comes to an international world, if we look at the universities in Tokyo or throughout Japan, the ranking is low in terms of the number of uh, students from abroad or the number of faculty members from abroad. Uh, the Japanese um, universities do not rank high in those terms. It's a very common thing throughout the world. From the standpoint of diversity, uh, it's strange that uh, that cannot be done more here in Japan. And so that's why we are lowly evaluated. So when talking about diversity, first of all, when you think about establishing a bi identity, I showed that uh, the architectures of the world are uh, common in the sense that skyscrapers are becoming more and more common. but then. You can tell a city by the high towers. Uh, so there's internationalization taking place, and uh, the world is becoming more uniform. And yet, at the same time, how can you establish your own identity? That's an issue. 
And one point to take into consideration is uh, the fact that uh, Professor Zukin has mentioned about authenticity. When we think about uh, authenticity to tell the difference between things, well, there was the example of Tokyo, but as something authentic, there may be some wonderful space. It exists as an authentic thing that people show much interest and evaluate highly. What would be a space like that? That's a difficult question, but can you think of any space that corresponds to that? value highly? Yeah, that's right. Well, again, I'm an outsider. Yeah, okay, no you problem. Know, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I actually want to return to the first question about diversity. Mm -hmm. I always get lost in Tokyo. If the different districts were so visually specific, how could I get lost? Oh, I see. So I'm, I'm still... Uh, I'm still... Uh, 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 stuck on on that point hmm. of how uh, of how the the districts are are visually distinctive. Okay. Well, uh, any comments from David? <laughs> well, that? Maybe you continue. I'll have something later. <laughs> well, uh, today uh, you just had a good chance to listen to the case of Ah Nihongo ne ano Yoshimi. Uh, from Professor Yoshimi, we've been able to hear a presentation. And we're familiar with the history of Tokyo, so that's how we look at Tokyo. And so, even if there are slight differences, we can tell what they are. Perhaps, uh, Sharon-san, you may think that it looks similar, whereas we consider them to be different. There may be a gap there. If I may comment. Uh, Venice is a wonderful city, I think. But I often get lost in Venice. And uh, it is a city where you can enjoy getting lost. In Tokyo, for example, there's Sendagi, or uh, around the area of Nezu Sendagi, or around Shimo Kitazawa. You see a maze of streets, and there are many uh, stores located in that maze. In Sendagi or Shimo Kitazawa, uh, Shimo Kitazawa developed after World War II, whereas Sendagi was an old part of the town. But we have many small towns in Tokyo, which make it enjoyable. And so, these are the things that link diversity and authenticity, and it is comfortable for us, and enjoyable for us in this maze-like environment. In regard to authenticity and diversity, how do we connect the two? In that sense, uh, Professor Zirkin, I will advertise this on your behalf. This is The Naked City, and this is published by Kodansha. And so if you were interested in her presentation, please buy the translation of her work. And in terms of authenticity, uh, she herself uh, wrote the following. Authenticity is to look at something and to feel something and to look at the uh, social enga engagement of that place. So a place is not necessarily authentic. It's not something distinct that makes it authentic. It's rather the relation between the place and the people who live there. That interaction generates authenticity. My understanding, perhaps, is that correct? Uh, it's interactive. So for an outsider, what authenticity represents as opposed to the authenticity in that residents feel are different from each other. There are various types of uh, authenticity. There are plural authenticities. So what kind of network or what kind of process is there for, uh, as a generic process, what is there to generate authenticity? I think uh, those are things that link very much to the subject of identity. Was that uh, idea of authenticity correct? Thank you.
thank you, Professor Yoshima, for <laughs> advertising my book. Uh, yes, in, 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 indeed, uh, the, um, the, the the idea of lived authenticity is exactly that uh, people stay for a long time in one district and that the activities for which that district becomes known become the culture of that district. And then the concentration of activity is, is what is recognized, mm. maybe not the visual form of the buildings, but the content of the buildings. It is the attachment of people to their lived environment that cities should encourage. When you have constant redevelopment and demolition followed by rebuilding, as tragically has often been the case in Tokyo, it's very difficult to create a sense of authenticity from nothing. So uh, I, I, um, I value myself, I value very highly the forms of continuity mm -hmm. that still exist. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would look for, continuity, not newness. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We're limited in time, so we'd like to move on to David. And David, now you have uh, designed and uh, there has been talk about uh, the uh, uh, south part and uh, because of Roppongi Hills, uh, Tokyo has changed. In the management of uh, Tokyo, there's good security and things are punctual and speedy. Those are elements. But from a design perspective, by the establishment of Roppongi Hills, do you think that uh, there has been some kind of impact on the identity of Tokyo? This is quite a bold question, but if you have any uh, answers you could provide in this regard. I, I think... Um I think Roppongi Hills presented a very unique urban model. Mm. Um, if, if New York has its Rockefeller Center in terms of scale, Roppongi is a Rockefeller Center, yet it's extremely different. Mm. Uh, it shows that there's a different way to plan a project compared to uh, Shinagawa, for mm. example, mm. Uh, which is very much a tower, a tower, a tower, a tower. Mm. Uh, without the soul that happens uh, at the pedestrian level. I think Roppongi is very interesting because uh, it's an ensemble of buildings. Mm. Um, if you compare Roppongi Hills with Midtown, a Midtown project here in Tokyo, uh, they're very different. Uh, perhaps Midtown is more similar to Rockefeller Center in that it was designed uh, by a single hand. Okay? Um, in this case, SOM is our competitor, right? Um, but Roppongi Hills, you know, while KPF was involved, we, we did a number of the buildings, but we didn't do them all. Uh, and in case a lot of times the, the designs didn't quite mix, it was actually a little bit chaotic, they collided. And, and I think that's where the interest or the excitement comes in. Um, and so in my mind, the best part of Roppongi Hills, it's not the individual buildings, uh, you know, which while interesting, um, are not as interesting as the in-between space. Mm -hmm. uh, so somehow, Roppongi has... I'm happy to get lost in Tokyo. It's actually quite a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. um, there's moments of that in Roppongi. Uh, even having been here and worked on the project, I still get lost. Right? Uh, but it's a good kind of lost because uh, you're discovering. Um, and, and perhaps it's that moment of discovery is, is what leads to this feeling of I've discovered something authentic. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so while Roppongi, it's a modern project, it, it's you know, somehow orchestrated and, and to some degree, it, it does have a measure of authenticity, mm -hmm. uh, which, which I think is, is quite rare in a new development. Mm -hmm. and, no, I, I do agree that uh, you know, Shinagawa is very important for Tokyo's future development, as is Ueno. I think Tokyo is a big city. You can have a downtown and an mm -hmm. a, a uptown. Um, 
but to sort of, if the, the planning of those areas could sort of maintain that unique Tokyo-ness mm -hmm. of it, uh, and not to be the Rockefeller Center, but to find a kind of urban pattern uh, or feeling that's really more uniquely about Tokyo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think uh, we can take questions for about 10 minutes or so. If you have any questions, please raise your hands and please state your name and affiliation and please uh, identify to whom you're addressing your question. Please raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, my name is Carlos Gonzalez. I'm from Toyota, a uh, recent graduate from MIT. And my question is about transportation and authenticity in cities. Uh, yesterday, ne Nicolas Negroponte was talking in the keynote about how um, autonomous driving could change drastically the way that people move in cities where there's not going to be uh, private cars anymore. And there is going to be more like a shared community that is already happening in the U.S. with Uber and all these phenomena. So um, to me, part of the authenticity of cities, definitely uh, New York, for example, uh, imagine Manhattan without the yellow cab is, is quite a, um, is, is difficult. Or the, and also London, the, the taxi is quite a unique element of, of the city. So uh, my, my question is like, how, how do you think the future of Tokyo could also be, benef could be, uh, could increase it, the, or could get better by autonomous driving if um, there's less cars, there's no parking lots, because there's all these units that are shared by all the, all the people. And uh, could be answered by anyone? Well, with the advancement of technology, maybe we're going to lose the characteristic or identity, I think, as part of this discussion. Anyone who cares to? Perhaps I, I would miss the taxis in Japan. Um, it's, it's one of the most wonderful experiences in the world to come to Tokyo. and. You step into a taxi and the driver has the white gloves and uh, it's just wonderful. And, and in a place like New York, it'd be great, okay, to have <laughs> autonomous driving, but um, would, would it really change Tokyo? I, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, if you look at New York now and, you know, sure we have Ubers and they've been very successful, but it really hasn't changed fundamentally the, the way the city behaves. Um, I, I believe there are certain optimizations that can occur when, it, when a city is able to optimize the amount of cars or it's able to optimize its housing stock through this uh, sort of technology-driven mm -hmm. solution. Um, you know, whether or not it completely transforms the city, I'm not sure. My understanding is that the subway system is, is the most energy-efficient way of moving people around the city. And if... Uh, it's important to transport commuters across great distances. Mm -hmm. Then I guess you know we we will have the the uh, the subway and continued modernization of the subway for the foreseeable future. Uh, within that paradigm, I think it's important to encourage local commuting patterns, mm -hmm. perhaps by bicycle, perhaps by some sort of light rail or trolley system, um, but that, that will require people to move shorter distances, mm. not longer distances. Mm. Yeah. So it might be interesting to consider the, the linking of different areas within a fairly small distance. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So in, in 1960s, uh, because in Tokyo Olympic game era, as you say, so we built, uh, for example, the uh, expressway, in high, very high expressway. And at the same time, uh, in Tokyo, the many metropolitan uh, the underway, under, underground system uh, have been developed. So uh, today, 
uh, we have so many, uh, say, such kind of the, uh, transportation system already, especially in downtown. So I think that one of the uh, has, has important things we, we can do is, uh, as uh, Professor Ichika already explained, uh, uh, for example, Nihonbashi, Nihonbashi, the, uh, the, say, the above Nihonbashi era, so we still have the very big and gigantic highway, expressway. So uh, in the process, uh, you know, uh, the, such kind of express was, was constructed. Many kinds of landscapes, precious landscapes, was destroyed in 1960s and 70s. So I think some of the landscape can be recovered uh, if we can delete uh, the, the expressway, because the number of the, the automobiles, uh, especially in downtown area, are going to, can, can be decreased in some extent. So, because, of, because we already have a many subway system and express system around the city. So as you said, if we decrease the number of the automobile, especially in downtown area, uh, we can have, we can recover, what we can, how to say, uh, get back some kind of the beautiful landscape in this downtown area of Tokyo. So this is my... Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a very good point. Yeah. Maybe we have time for one more question. Anyone else? Yes, go ahead. We enjoy the sort of diverse opinions of the panel. My name is Wayne. I'm a student of architecture. And from listening to the discussion, um, as an outsider myself to Tokyo, I wonder uh, for each of the panelists what your model for a uh, spatially as well as socially diverse city is. Um, I subconsciously make comparisons to Manhattan where, as uh, Professor Zukin has mentioned, historically there has been sort of uh, geographically uh, different zones such as say the Lower East Side or Upper Harlem where there have been a very uh, concentrated amount of uh, people from a certain social group or race. And in Tokyo, it seems that, perhaps a simple way of looking at it is, uh, the more authentic uh, regions tend to be full of homogen uh, homogenized uh, local inhabitants, whereas the new uh, development encourages sort of outsiders, and these things seem to be sort of opposing to another. So I wonder, uh, in your mind, what is the sort of model for bringing these two perhaps different sides of the city together, or whether there is a model at all for these two things, and whether they can coexist. Thank you. Well, actually, I was thinking of asking that question. I'm glad you asked that question. Regarding diversity, of course, sociological interpretation, social and physical interpretations are possible as well. I think the biggest theme for Tokyo is that we currently have a very homogeneous culture. Uh, in terms of ethnicity, we don't have diversity in Japan. And spatially, I think that's the same as well. The theme of uh, the session, internationalization, globalization, within that context, what is the identity of Tokyo is the essential question. Uh, and this business as usual, uh, there is a concern that maybe the outsiders are going to drive uh, the transformation of Tokyo. But today, we talked about continuity. Sharon emphasized the significance, the importance of uh, continuity, historical continuity. If we focus on historical values, if we can retain that even when there are things coming from outside, uh, maybe we don't have to worry about losing something from the past. So uh, could you answer uh, my question together with that question asked by Wei? Sharon? Questions. Um, <laughs> You know, cities are always palimpsests. When you speak about digging deep, uh, that, that certainly uh, uh, expresses the idea that cities are built in layers. Sometimes the outsiders cannot see the older layers because they've been covered over, but, uh, but, but the, layers, uh, the layers exist and, and shape to some degree what comes. 
So we have this, this vertical growth of the, of the city, and I'm not speaking about height, I'm speaking in a more metaphorical sense. But we also have uh, in, in increasing functions of cities. So there's an, more groups of people coming to cities, concentrations of activities weakening, new concentrations growing. So there's a horizontal growth of cities. Diversity is a, a uh, logical result of both the vertical growth and horizontal growth of cities. Uh, it's, it's difficult for an outsider mm. to make a prescription, to say this is how the city must become more diverse. Um, perhaps issues that are outside of our range of expertise are important. For example, the kinds of alliances, coalitions, um, agreements that can be made between different types of institutions, between universities, for example, between cultural institutions. Uh, also, an important factor is the rigidity or the flexibility of the state government. That is always a crucial factor in trying to leverage the resources of a city to make it great for the future. If you could be brief, thank you. Um, you know, may maybe, maybe part of Tokyo's uniqueness is that it is uh, very Japanese, right? Um, go going back to my, my fish analogy with, with the coral reef, it's, it's something about the local environment. If it is self-contained, um, it sort of incubates a sort of unique identity. And one thinks about what if Tokyo or what if Japan became too global, would it lose its uniqueness, right? Um, so I think, I think right now Tokyo is at this uh, tipping point, maybe, in its, in its decision making. I, I think actually it's achieved a wonderful balance, presently, in my opinion, um, where we could always come to Tokyo and find something uh, I, I didn't find before. Um, a lot of that's now actually being exported back into America. Like I, I used to love coming here and you find a Muji store or a, Unicuro store, right? And now, now these are being exported. They've sort of become uh, less unique because now they're finding their way into America. But nonetheless, there was that ability of, of, of Japan and perhaps Tokyo in particular, like no other Asian city, to actually uh, create and incubate its own modern popular culture. Uh, this is very special to me about uh, post-war Japan. It's actually has it has a popular culture which is now as i mentioned being exported out and so it, it's it's a dilemma like do should tokyo really really open up and, and globalize and, and embrace all that change or should it still in some ways incubate itself uh, and as a result be special i will uh, talk about just the two points very briefly just the first point I do not think that uh, there has been no diversity in Tokyo before. It is uh, after the war that we have lost diversity. During the Edo period, that's when we had diverse cultures all gather in Edo, or the samurais gathered together in Edo, which means that it was very diverse back then. And then come Meiji, Taishio era. We have colonized Asian nations. This is not good, it was not good. However, what happened was that we were exposed to various countries, and we have absorbed the cultures from other countries. So it's not the case that Tokyo has never been diverse. It was diverse before. It was in the post-war, in the high economic growth period, that we have lost diversity. Why did this happen? It's not just a cultural aspect. There is the economic development, mass production, mass consumption that has uh, covered all of our Japan. That's the way we have lost our diversity. Second point. 
This uh, diversity is one of the integral um, theme that is uh, discussed in sociology. We can talk about this for about more than one hour. When we talk about, think about diversity, on the back side of it, there is um, differentiation, discrimination, or inequality, or conflict, negotiation process. These and the, the gaps are something that exists on the other side of diversity. So if we become a city of a diversity, and in order to maintain a good city, it's we need to have a good community or commonness or something that can be shared. It should not lead to disparity or gaps. Things should be shared. It should be an open diversity. That kind of function needs to be incorporated into the society. Thank you. The topic today was to think about identity of uh, Tokyo and the future of Tokyo, how it is to be created. I think we got a lot of good answers here today. And whether or not it can be realized or whether it's going to be really attractive, it's something that we need to think about. Thank you for your kind attendance.